I've always said that not too many bow hunters are going to want to do it the way I do it. Where do these big bucks travel to get from one of these hot spots to the other one? I'm wrapping up an evening of wet elk country hunting. And what I wanted to do was continue our conversation and continue this introduction of Eddie Claypool to the Camel Matrix channel. And what we're doing here is we're discussing some general information about how Eddie places his tree stands for whitetail hunting. All right, Eddie, so we'll kind of continue with the questions where uh, we're trying to help these DIY hunters out. And one of the questions was about how you make your tree stand placement. I mean, the camo matrix is, is it's been about camo, and these guys are you know thinking about how they can conceal themselves. But you know, we kind of know that it, it really comes down to you know that placement versus really you know what it is that they're seeing. And I've seen some of your tree stand locations, and they're way out of the norm of what when you walk the woods and you see a ladder stand sitting there, you see somebody's. Uh, strap-on stand sitting there. Yours have been in some weird places. So uh, tell me about how you choose a ladder stand location for white tail. White tail. Well, I've always said that not too many bow hunters are going to want to do it the way I do it because, you know, as many years ago, I kind of graduated through the stages of, you know, learning where to put them, get the deer by, get deer, then get bucks, then get better bucks, and then finally, I got to the point where I didn't want to hunt normal. I didn't want to just see deer and lots of deer and good bucks. I wanted to just try to figure out how to see the top enders once in a while and get them around. And they're almost unkillable anyway. I mean, they're vapors. They, they. But what I do with tree stands nowadays, if you're if you're up for it, is I hunt. What I call, you know, years ago, there was a guy that wrote for North American Whitetail Magazine coined the term travel corridors, big buck travel corridors. Yeah. And that is not hunting your standard places. You're, when people go out and scout for whitetail sign, they find hot spots, a lot of rubs, maybe a lot of scrapes, yeah. trail intersections and everything. That's where the deer herd has high interaction places, that's fine. That's not where the big bucks live. And that's not what the big bucks do. And so right off the bat, if you're not interested in just hunting really big, old, mature, smart bucks, you probably don't want to do what I do. So, I mean, how would you like me to address the question of whitetail tree stand placement for killing deer or for just the trophy bucks? Well, let's try to do both you know okay. if, so uh, if some if a man wants to if, if they're wanting to you know put something on their wall that really means something to them that was harder that they had to wait longer for um you know let's address the the big bucks the trophy ones are two categories to me the top end ones and the trophies trophies are anything to me from a pope and young caliber deer up and it, of course that all depends on where you're hunting you might not even have Pope and Young Caliber deer where you hunt. So if you want to just hunt your better deer, I don't hunt right at the hot spots. Because, well, if you're going to only hunt two days a week, go set on hot spots. If you're going to hunt, if you're going to take a week off work and hunt an area or two weeks or like me, two months, you can't set the hot spots or you run all the deer off. You educate them all and they move and they get smart and the hot spots are no longer good. So it's like a, go find the hot spots, like find three or four of them in a square mile. And then if you're after the big guy, wait till the rut when they're traveling and they're out of their mind, which occurs usually anytime after 7th to 10th of November. I used to focus my main kill on mid to late November. And I was just after the big guys, and that's about the only time they're going to show up much in the middle of the day doing dumb stuff. Is usually, actually, the peak week is around Thanksgiving. But previous to that, go hunt your hot spots. You may luck off, it, it happens, and you might see one of them, you might kill one of them. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a lot of happenstance if it works out. But now you can kill your smaller and medium sized ones. 
in your hot spots. If you want to just try for just the big ones, wait to mid-November. You got to about be willing to set all day. That's a big one because most people ain't setting all day. Yeah, it's, then, it's a tough thing to do. Yes, it is. And you got to get prepared gear wise. And then the key is like, why would I set all day if I don't see nothing? And I get it. You got to have the savvy to know where to put that stand, right? Mm -hmm. These big buck travel corridors, I don't even really, I've spent all my life writing about it and I still don't know how to explain it. It's kind of like, it's like to me, I look at the whole picture not any one thing, the whole picture. And then after I've done that, I'll get a feeling to where, basically, where do these big bucks travel to get from one of these hot spots to the other one? Because that's what they do at night. They travel from the where the doe concentrations are, but you don't want to try to hunt them there because you're going to run all your does off. You're going to goof the whole place up pretty quick, right? So I hunt them in the in-between. A and B, I get in the middle. And you gotta learn how to find those spots, and I don't know how to tell it exactly. Um, I'll give you an instance. I hunt the prairie of Kansas a lot. There's big creek drainages, and they may be a mile or two apart. And it's just prairie in between. Once in a while, there'll be windrows, hedgerows, sometimes gullies, fence lines. I set fence lines a lot out in the prairie. I may sit there 12 hours and see one or two deer, but chances are in mid to late November, it's gonna be a big buck because they don't travel the normal places and do the normal things. They, they stay, they'll travel the, I call it middle ground, the ground in between the two spots. And they do it a lot at night, which makes it a lot unhuntable. But I set out there in places that I don't advise other people to hunt. I really tell the average bow hunter, go hunt, go, go foot scout till you're dropping dead and find your hot spots. Cause it, people all, everybody knows about scrapes and rubs. Yeah. And when you find concentrations of them, you've, you know, and trail crossings there, which will be there, you have a hot spot. Well, that's fine. Set it, but don't hunt it except under the right conditions and only hunt it about once every three to four days. Don't go in there and just repetitively set it five days in a row. You're gonna see good action first day, not so good the second day. And by the third day, you're gonna be like, wow, this ain't too good anymore. And that's just, you've, you've just, you've really ruined the area. You with have. With scent, with movement, with, you know, just, and, and their awareness. Whitetails are the absolute aces at figuring things out quick and keep them guessing keep them guessing you're better off to only hunt a hot spot once every four or five days if it's right when you hunt it right wind direction you approach it right uh, and there is a million factors involved in all this i can't even address them but as far as tree stand placement let me get back here real quick to hunt average bucks just go out and do what everybody tells you which is hunt the hot spots go find them you got to go find them you ain't gonna find them probably on Google Earth. You got a foot scout. So you're, we're talking about trail. We're talking about- um, Concentrations yeah, of deer of, signs. Of yeah, scrapes, rubs. Where they're feeding at, yeah. where they're bedding at. You don't gotta know their exact beds, but you can go like, they're feeding on these oaks. It's covered with deer droppings and sign. And they're probably going around here on the north side of this slope and bedding during the day and coming back and forth. Well, get in the middle there and hunt them. Or if you're just going to hunt two days a week, go ahead and hunt that hot spot. Set right there where they're feeding. But if they're feeding, you better get in there in the middle of the day and get ready. And, let, and don't go walking in there at 5 o'clock in the evening. You know what I mean? Uh, I, honestly, the more I talk about tree stand placement, the more I've written about, wrote about it over the years, the more confusing it is because I have never figured out how to tell someone how to do it. And when you tell them the real way to do it, the true way, they just zone you out because it takes wood savvy. Yeah, well, woodsmanship is a big key, I think, in locating them. It is. There, there's 10, like 10 steps of it. And until you take the time and focus to go master them, 
Somebody can't tell you how to do it. It yeah. will not stick. It'll go right in one ear and out the other. Go learn it. Okay. Nobody wants to hear my key to success, which is time and effort. Oh, I don't, you've surely got some magical pill you take, or you've got a book that's got all the formulas in it. No, I don't. I work harder than everybody else, and I do it longer. You, there's nothing, nothing st that will take the place of time. And if, if you don't have time, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. So I don't want to disappoint people, and I, it disappoints everybody. They think, well, you're an expert. You know how to tell me exactly how to do it. You don't want to hear the real way, so I can give you all these other little things that sound like an expert talking to you, but at the end of the day, get your rear end out there and figure it out. Um, that's why somebody like me has good success, because I've been doing it since I was a kid, and I do it at a rate that very few humans on this planet do it at. Yeah, yeah, I can agree. So that'll be something that we can do in the future is start to break down some of these key things that people, beyond getting out there, putting their feet on the ground, being able to read the, the woods of, of where they're at. And each one might be a little bit different just because, you know, the dense deciduous forests of East Coast versus you've got, uh, you've got rolling grass hills with, uh, with, um, tree line streams right. in the in the Midwest. Then, of course, you know, out here it's another West, completely yeah. different game. So, we'll try to address how some of those things might be, just yeah. because they might be so completely different. Well, they're completely different because I've been blessed to get to hunt whitetails everywhere from the state of New York to Minnesota, Wisconsin, to Texas, to Montana. I've hunted western whitetails. I've hunted high plains. Uh, cornfield, Midwestern, I mean, yeah, and I'm telling you, every bit of it is different. The deer are different. Uh, the habitat's totally different, and I've, I, I'm not going to lie, back east is the hardest there is. The big woods whitetails and the mountains and the big woods, plus they're super educated deer. They've been wiped out for generations. They're very smart. I don't never take anything from an eastern whitetail hunter. He is, if he if he gets good at killing mature bucks back east with a bow, he's as good a whitetail hunter as it will, there will be. Because there's places to hunt whitetails where they're not educated. The habitat's way more conducive to figuring it out and getting them in bow range. And I love to hunt easy whitetails. I call them easy whitetails. A lot of times I've come, down, come out west and hunted them in everywhere from the, you know, uh, Dakotas to Nebraska, Kansas, out to the Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, western whitetails. And generally speaking, um, out west, I have a lot better, quicker success. Yeah, they're, they're not nearly as in, in tune with the population of, no. of humans that are out right. there as they are on the east coast. I mean, I can, I can attest to, you know, when you're in the woods and you may have figured out that they've been coming in one particular way and you sit there and you set yourself up that way and then here they come another way yeah because they can come in from so many different right. areas it's big such a woods. dense area so it's big terrain it's that's a lot of stuff to, to learn and cover but it uh, is but, when i went to new york one time hunted 10 days and i was at in the middle peak of my bow hunting life and i had a lot of knowledge and in those 10 days i had one good buck in bow range i mean i had to do every i had to pull every stop out to try to get that one opportunity and, uh, you know, like in Kansas, or if I come out here in Montana and hunt some, I expect to see a good buck and maybe get them in bow range every two or three days, you know. And uh, so there is a difference. And I, I take my hat off to Yankee whitetail hunters, especially because the population, the habitat, the animal, it's just a, it's a top end game to, to kill a good buck back east. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully in the future we can start to detail some of these maybe these uh, tree stand placement kind of uh, some rules to go by in different areas and uh, and have it to where people can can take it and then put it out in the field and see if it works for them right
Be sure to like and subscribe for any future videos with Eddie. And go ahead and put your questions in the comments below for any future discussions with him.